Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. The Big Mistake, written by AIS. In the year 2021, engineer Michael Porter finally got his new request approved to work on the ELINP project. The ELIMP derives from extreme light infrastructure, nuclear physics, and, in simple terms, is the world's first 10 petawatt laser in the world. Two years later, he came up with the theory to use this big-ass laser as a way to send signals into space, but with such intensity that the beam would pierce the fabric of the universe and come out at the designated distance, faster than the speed of light so extremely long-range, almost instant communications. The advantage of such technologies were obvious, so NASA got involved. Since the ELINP laser was built in an underground facility and not really meant for sending signals into space, NASA brought Michael Porter in Florida and put him in charge of building another big-ass laser, but this time dedicated to put his theory into practice. Americans, being American, decided to build a laser even stronger than the ELINP. So, the Extreme Long Range Extreme Light Communicator, or the ELR ELI project, was born. The world's first 50 petawatt laser, equipped with an advanced targeting system that could compensate for Earth's rotation, for the target speed, and so on. It could send a beam that could hit a nickel placed on the surface of the moon. The most simple way to send data using the ELR ELI was Morse code, but there were other options, like transmitting into binary simply by converting the on-off into 0-1. Decimals or hexadecimals were also possible soon. We had a way to communicate, but no one to communicate with. Sure, we used this to communicate to rovers on Mars, to space missions, but still, we felt like Alexander Graham Bell must have felt like. We had a phone, but no one to talk to. So the next step was the following. We built a receiver, like a big satellite dish, around the ELR ELI. When the ELR ELI was not used to communicate to our own equipment, like rovers and shuttles, it was pointed at all known planets we discovered, one at a time, and it would send a simple message, like, hello, in binary towards the surface, and we would listen for a response. We figured that if anyone would receive our signal, they would send back something similar to the location of the transmitting device. Two years it took to go through all planets we knew about. When we finished transmitting to all the planets we had discovered so far, we also started to transmit to locations where we only suspected planets might be. We also sent signals to spaces between the planets and stars, into the blackest void, aiming to reach beyond the observable universe. Years passed, technology advanced, other ELR ELI devices were built, including one on our first colony on Mars. Smaller, similar devices were built, more efficient, designed for just communication between Mars and Earth or between Earth and space missions. The original ELR ELI had only one job, to send our hello into space and to listen for a reply. It was in the year 2059 that the reply came back. It was a similar signal, an extreme light beam broken into segments. It copied the original signal that hello we sent in binary, and had some additional signal at the end. We translated it as two times two. Amidst the chaos and excitement that broke out, we finally managed to send back an answer. Four. So started our first communications with a race that called themselves the Mari. Right from the start, it was clear that their technology was leaps and bounds ahead of ours, but it was also clear that they were friendly and willing to share their knowledge with us. Communication was slow and frustrating via the ELR ELI, but because we were different species, binary remained the only language that both civilizations could understand. We started to exchange information about us. Among the first things exchanged were the periodic tables from each civilization. As a result, we found out that they were two were carbon-based life forms. Apparently, they were smaller than us, about a quarter of our mass, and a bit different, four legs and four arms. But their atmosphere was pretty similar in composition to ours, and, apparently, 
With their advanced medicine, they had a span of life of 600 years on average. This discussion led us to the first present we received from the Mari. They sent us a very complicated chemical formula, but only with elements from our own periodic table. The Mari were declared unconditional allies when our scientists discovered the formula was for a very interesting substance that would cure cancer, amongst other 20 or so diseases that still plague our civilization. After this came ideas for clean energy, formulas for new types of building materials, lighter, stronger, and more durable. They sent a map of the stars between them and us. They sent us ways to accelerate the terraforming of Mars. It was like they couldn't send us all that they knew fast enough, and we couldn't decipher all the information that was coming fast enough. We had thousands of scientists from all over the world working on all the information they were sending. The communications were slow, and the volume of information so large that many mistakes were made. From deciphering wrong to overlapping of projects, to missing bites caused by different cosmic events, one passing comet between Earth and their planet caused such a distortion of the message that instead of a formula for a material that could be used for spaceship's windows, what we received and deciphered was the formula for some type of biodegradable styrofoam. Ten years after we made contact by phone with them, we asked them for a way to make communications faster. We asked them to meet us. They responded that while they did have FTL ships, they couldn't spare one at the moment to make the journey towards Earth. Even with their faster ships, they calculated it would take almost a year for the trip between us. And apparently, they were engaged in a war. And all ships and resources were directed towards the war effort. The news about the Mari being at war got to the world's leaders in their mother of all turmoil. All talk about unconditional allies was forgot. All information transmitted towards them was stopped. The teams of scientists working on the data that we had from the Mari now all had at least two military observers each. Paranoia was starting to rise its ugly head. Alarmist questions and conspiracy theories were running rampant. What if we are next? It was a mistake to send that signal into space. They want us to develop the Earth, to do all the work. And after that, they'll come and take it from us. The cure for cancer causes autism, and so on. Thankfully, not everyone panicked. The chief scientist in charge of the project, ELR, ELI, sent back a simple question. Who are you fighting, and why? The answer that came back was expansive. Ten years ago, we were the first life form outside their system that they had ever contacted. Or, to be fair, that contacted them. They intercepted our signal by chance with one of their planet satellites. Then they made a device similar to our ELR ELI to answer us, and even copied our method of calling in the dark, searching for other civilizations. With their more advanced technology, they achieved results faster than us. In less than a year after they started broadcasting into the dark, they received an answer. But it was not a friendly hello. It was a fleet of hollowed asteroids. Inside, swarms of bugs-like creatures. On the surface of the meteors, giant plasma spewing bugs acted as ship-to-ship -ship weapons and propulsion. A race of unall-consuming roaches had found them, tracking their signal, and was set on devouring them. And everyone on that lived on their planet. All attempts of communication were rebuked by the bugs. They were merciless and implacable. Their preferred method of attack was to crash into the Mari ships, pierce their hulls, and swarm them with overwhelming numbers. Then, using those ships to land them the planets below and to start their cycle of eating and multiplying, until everything was consumed. After that, to break the planet into media-like chunks, and launched themselves again in space, in search of other planets. Now about eight years into the fight for their survival, the Mari were down to a single planet, their home world. They will survive as long as possible, but their chances for them to repel the voracious enemy was almost zero. They will continue to send us all their knowledge, so that we could have a fighting chance if the bugs ever find us too. The message ended with a question. Would you like to know more? If 
Before this message, we were afraid. Now, we were afraid and ashamed. But now we had an enemy, and our unconditional allies were on the verge of extinction. The people that started a new golden age of science on Earth were dying for eight years now, and never asked us for anything. Instead, they gave us all they could. We asked them for weapons, ships, engine designs. We asked them for FDL. We asked for everything we thought that could give us a chance against those bugs. And we promised them that the first warship we will make by these designs will come to their aid, filled with volunteers. That must have elicited some bitter smiles from their part. They answered that they already lost close to 5,000 ships. One more would not make any difference. Stay safe, they transmitted. Stay safe, grow strong, and don't repeat our mistakes of trusting the universe is a kind and as friendly as you are. Still, they began transmitting us all the data we needed for an FTL engine, for ship-to-ship -ship weapons, ship designs, formula for hull materials, air recycling engines, and whatnot. So much data that all other projects were put on hold, Everyone was working on deciphering the data needed for the ship. The ship that we arrogantly named Cavalry. Thousands of contractors were hired to build it. It was a project that united the world. A futile gesture, probably. But a gesture to express our gratitude for all the Marie had done for us. The Cavalry started to be built even before the information was finished coming through. Sure. Errors were bound to happen, like after we started building the hull, the airlock seemed too big and not compatible with our other ships and space stations. So we corrected them and made them smaller. Living quarters, again, they were too big and comfortable, a waste of space. Storage for weapons it is then. The main weapon of the ship seemed kind of weak, like it would take some time to pierce the hull like this, so we made them bigger. Maybe that's a human thing. There is no such thing as an overkill when it comes to bugs. So we added other types of weapons too. There was so much unused space all around the hull, ready to be filled with guns. From a sleek, smooth-surfaced hull, we made a hedgehog of a ship, bristling with weapons, railguns, missile ports, point defenses. Also, some nukes, because, uh, because, uh, thick bugs, that's why. Life-supporting systems. We had basically to install like ten of them, to ensure that it could sustain the crew. We knew that they were smaller than us, and obviously consumed less air, water, food, but we had to install ten of everything that we'd related to life support. Air filtering pumps, water recycling, hydroponics. All these had to expand and multiply. Luckily, the design of the ship was spacious enough that we had room for everything. In six months, cavalry was launched. It had a crew of 1,350, all volunteers. Total length was almost 800 meters. With the hull from the new lighter material, it still had 120,500 tons. It had taken quite the toll on our resources as the planet. But there was not a human on the entire Earth and Mars that did not feel filled with pride as the cameras transmitted the launch around the planet. We watched with tears in our eyes as the cavalry galloped towards our friends, the Mari. Our friends said the trip between the planets would take almost a year, but the cavalry pushed its engines to maximum. The trip only took four months. Maybe the initial estimate was based on the older type of engine. Maybe our modifications made the engines better. The reason was not yet clear. But everyone sighed with relief when the cavalry finally arrived in the Mari system and found Mari ships still fighting around their home planet, facing what looked like a cloud of meteors. It was a strange kind of battle, with the sleek Mari ships constantly dodging the meteorites and their bug plasma spews while trying to coordinate their fire, two or three at a time, against one single meteorite. Even if the Mari ships were clearly more maneuverable than the bug-infested meteorites, the sheer number of enemies was so great that the cloud of meteorites was actually chasing the ships and pushing them towards the Mari planet. The cavalry didn't waste any time or thought. 
It accelerated towards the meteorite cloud, all weapons hot. It reached weapons range in two minutes flat and began spitting missiles, real gun slugs, and high-powered laser beams like the wrath of God. It took full advantage of the elements of surprise and drove straight through the cloud of meteors, getting even a point of fences in range and firing those guns too. It came out the other side of the cloud, after cracking three of the larger meteorites and countless other smaller ones. The space between the meteorites was now filled with debris, bugs, and various bug remains. No meteor had successfully crashed into the cavalry's hull. The human ship turned and made another strafing run by the enemy formation, this time keeping on the edge of the meteor cloud. A few plasma shots from the bugs managed to hit them though, but they did not penetrate the hull. It just corroded about half an inch deep on the surface. The hull was 20 inch thick, so it was no immediate danger. That did not mean that the captain was not pissed as hell that the bugs dirtied his brand new ship. He initiated a transmission on all available channels towards the Mari ships to stand back and gave the order to launch nuke number one, pet named Gaia. The missile with the nuke looked no different than any of the dozens of other missiles launched in the same instant by the cavalry. It beelined straight towards the biggest meteorite in the cloud impacted in a cloud of red fire and red dust, followed by a beautiful, visible shockwave that turned to dust all the meteorites in the immediate vicinity. Cheers went out on the human ship as almost half of the remaining enemies were pulverized or at least cracked. Not wanting to leave the enemy a chance to sober up, the cavalry charged once more into the fray. The Mari ships, invigorated by the shift of power, rejoined the battle and followed the cavalry's wake. This was when the human captain noticed that the surviving Mari ships were all small ones, barely corvette type. If even that, the cavalry would pass by the enemies, hit like a sledgehammer, cracking and pulverizing all the bigger meteors. And in its wake, the Mari ships would nimbly concentrate their fire on the still active enemies, giving the finishing blows with surgical precision. Two hours later, the meteors were all cracked and emptied of their foul contents, and for the first time in more than ten years, the human and the Mari managed to open communication channel with audio and video. After all the pleasantries were exchanged, in the excited discussions that followed, the humans found out with astonishment that a really big mistake was made. When receiving and deciphering the instructions for the ship due to our communication, switching from binary to hexadecimal and back, we ended up multiplying everything in the hull by 16. 16 times bigger, 16 times thicker, and from this, everything about the ship was modified. This explained all the extra space inside, the need for 10 times more life-supporting systems, all the space in the hull for extra weapon pods. Everything made sense now. A big mistake, an expensive mistake, and in the end, a happy one. The commander of the cavalry just made a series of grunts from which the crew managed to understand that, Ha! Huh, I guess size does matter. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon, WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.